Hey, welcome to episode 109 of Tangible Takeaways. I'm Jackson, and today I'm going to talk about the importance of opening our heart before God when we engage spiritual disciplines. My name is Tom Mercer, and I'm going to listen to what Jackson says about that. And, and probably say some good also, stuff. We may, yeah, we may see some good things. We're actually going to talk a little politics today. Just a little bit. Yeah. All that and more on this episode of Tangible Takeaways. We got Pastor Tom in the building today. Hey, hey. Hey, thanks for being here. <laughs> My pleasure, Yeah, Jackson. It, it was fun having you back in the pulpit this weekend. And um, and I know, man, for me, I, just, I loved your message. I loved the, um, I was so excited to hear you talk about that passage. And um, mm, Thanks. And I think in a way that only you could, you covered it in such a cool way. And you so the Super Bowl and the passage, the Super Bowl the and the passage yeah. always, you know, I'm <laughs> little drum rolls to see the Super Bowl Thank prediction. You. Thank so you. unfortunately did not come true. <laughs> I'll be here all week. I think you, I think last year you did <laughs> wait predict the Super wait, Bowl. Wait, 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 wait. You said it didn't come true. I said the chiefs would win the Super Bowl. Ah, uh, okay. But I said, Jesus was going to come back at the end of the second quarter, mm. which, you know, timing is on him. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And since he didn't come back, Jackson, who won the Super the Bowl? The Chiefs did win. Thank so, you. So, yeah. Thank so, I guess you could have gone either way. Jesus was either going to come back or the Chiefs are going to win. Well, so. we knew the 49ers were going to lose. Yeah. And I would say, for those of you who are listening or watching 49er fans, I was with you. Yeah. The storyline's great. Who's, I, who's I rooting love, against Brock Purdy? Uh, that's hard. It's hard to root against that guy. You know, you when you get older... Were you? Are you? You're a Charger fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up a Ram fan. Mm. And when they left to go to St. Louis, I gave up on the NFL. And so when they came back and tried to woo me back into <laughs> the fold, I've uh, I'm kind of half-heartedly a Ram fan. But I cheer for players. Yeah, and there are some guys that I just really rally around. I yeah. could be, you know president of the fan club and uh brock purdy uh at least from my perspective yeah has been a real stand-up guy in regard to the faith yep. his faith yeah and so i was cheering i was cheering for him yeah and uh it's not that i'm a 49ers guy but if he'd have been playing for uh almost anybody in the league i might uh I, i'm you'd, maybe be, been you'd be pulling for him. for him yeah yeah but anyway yeah so all that to say, uh, we covered the Super Bowl and, and that section and the passage, of First Peter 2. Which is, so. I was excited for all of it. Oh, you know, I was, good, I was pumped for it. All right. Um, and, I, and I think that that, um, you know, so interesting, the, the cornerstone message from Peter. It's interesting because he gives a, a similar message in Acts as mm -hmm. well. Um, he is just drawn to that imagery of Jesus as the cornerstone. And, uh, and I loved your... Uh, attributing special and specific to Jesus. And really that's almost our problem culturally yeah. is we pretty much most anybody can get around the special aspects of Jesus. We still talk about him 2000 years later. You kind of have to be nuts to say that there's not something special about Jesus. Right. That we're still talking about the guy, but then the specific element of he's, he's the way, the truth and the life and nobody, nobody else. Nobody comes to the father. Yeah. Like when him, yeah. you get into that zone, that is incredibly specific. And you kind of left with the CS Lewis thing of like, he's either nuts or he's God. Yeah. There's really no other option. Incredibly specific and incredibly unpopular. Yeah. Yeah. Once you hear the specific things that he says, and I mean, yeah. you see that through the gospels, right? I mean, he says, all these people come out to hear him teach, he teaches, and then right. they run away. Like this can't be the guy. Um, and as you're saying that, I think it's easy for us to, you know, kind of wag our fists at the world and say like, yeah, you guys can't get on board. But it's like, we have a hard time getting right. on board with the specific, you know, things about Jesus. And so as, as you're talking about that and talking about us being these kind of living stones that can move around a little bit, how, how would I realize that I'm out of alignment with the cornerstone? What are some kind of ways that we could catch that in our own lives? I would tell you. Yeah, thank you. That's so. I'll just I'll Jackson, just carry you, you around with me. me. Yeah, you can always count on me. Give you a call. Oh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, you know, as a Christian, there are uh, um, there are times that we look for excuses to hmm. do what we want to do, and then there are times that we look for, let's say, evidence for doing the right thing. 
Mm. Reasons, yeah, not excuses. And uh, when you're in that zone where you're just hard-hearted, and I think Christians can fall into this category, non-believers certainly are living in this category, but I think a Christian or Christian people can kind of fall back and we just get selfish and we say, this is what I want to do. Mm. And then we look for excuses as to why uh, it's a good idea. Mm. Um, whereas if we are constantly having an open heart for God to show us um, what to do, where to go, um, how much to say, how little to say, mm. who to engage in our oikos and when to engage them or invest in them, or when would be a good time to invite them. Certainly every day is a good day to pray for them. Uh, but when we're just open to the Spirit's leading, mm. most of the time you're going to make a good choice. Mm. Uh, it, it's just those, those times when we begin to get away from you know, our rhythms in our personal walk with God and we start to ignore the word and we kind of break fellowship maybe by not attending our small group or we, we stop going to church. You know, you kind of see the, the uh, slippery slope saying, well, I'll just watch online. Mm. And then you're watching online every month and then you're not watching at all. Mm. Well, when you're in kind of that little season or one of those seasons of life, it's, it's really hard to stay in alignment yeah. with the Lord. Uh, but, um, you know, keep your rhythms up and, uh, and, and just count on the Holy Spirit to show you. I, I was just having lunch with one, one of my friends, and he was talking about sharing with some guys in his oikos, and as he's driving, and they're non-believers, and as he's driving to that meal, uh, dinner I think it was, he was saying, Lord, just give me the words. I don't even know where the conversation's going to go. But that guy was in a good place. Mm. So I'm sure the conversation went well. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I but, but it is uh, important to um, stay in alignment. And man, we can come up with a lot of excuses why we should get out of alignment if we're not, you know, keeping those rhythms at, yeah. a, good, at a good pace. Yeah. That uh, Galatians 6 passage that you read this weekend, that's like, for me, that's a passage that shook me up and changed my life when it, like, I feel like it was really the Spirit opened my eyes to see the meaning there of, man, God's not mocked. Whatever you're investing in, that's what you're yeah, going to reap. Right. Yeah. And it's like, that makes so much sense logically, but for whatever reason, as Christians, we're so comfortable living with the dissonance of, well, I'll just invest in kind of all this worldly stuff and, and baptize my, my personality as like, well, that's just who I am and I'm yeah. still in Christ and baptize my interests and my hobbies and say, well, those things, are, those are all in Christ too. It's like, <laughs> no, that's yeah. not true. Like these things are, these things are enemies to the, what the spirit is doing and the flesh and the spirit aren't working in it's the same direction. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. There are spiritual forces that are trying to derail us constantly, hmm. and uh, I, I think your, you know, your your comment is so good that we have to align ourselves to the cornerstone all the time. Hmm. You know, there's that time when you come to Christ. You know, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church, and you come to Him. Yeah. You know, as verse what four said. Yeah, you come to him, and uh, you're aligning your life now with the cornerstone. But man, every day, multiple times a day, yeah, it's your opinions have to. You got to have a gut check, especially in the culture we live in now. Yeah, with all the the politics and this yeah, this craziness that <laughs> is debated constantly, <laughs> and we can get so caught up in what our opinion is. And the question is not is is our opinion better than the other political party's opinion. The question is, what does Jesus say? Yeah. And you just have to say, all right, I've, I've all had my, maybe my zeal for a particular political um, ideology to kind of move me a little left or a little right hmm. of what Jesus said. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but our opinion and the decisions we make, and I think the third one was the purpose that we bring to the table every day. Uh, it's so easy for those to lose alignment. Mm. That's, and that's the living stone space. We can move. We can move in and out. But uh, just keeping your rhythms up and and uh, 
if you're in a good spot, good things happen. So mm. if you're in a bad spot, bad things happen. That's very profound, I know. Uh, some good things can happen when you're in a bad spot, but they tend to be worse. Yeah. Then when you're walking with the Lord in the Word, in church, going to your small group, and, and you're just careful. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it is true. Those rhythms of those spiritual disciplines, mm-hmm. the things that we feel like those might sound not like grace and, you know, this yeah. very, it's those things though that keep us, um, it, y- you can, now the thing is you can engage with them in two different ways. You can kind of go the box checking route of like, I went to church, I read my Bible, I prayed, whatever. Right. But I never in one of those instances opened up my heart before the Lord right. and allowed him to work on me. Or there's every single one of those is this almost portal into the presence of God where I'm being transformed and renewed and ever aligned to the cornerstone. And that's that kind of, you know, I think many Christians exercise the disciplines. Few do that, man, opening myself up before the Lord and allowing him to work in me. And that's what leads us to that good spot that you're talking about where when you're in a good spot, you're almost... um, It's not that you're perfectly in tune with the cornerstone. It's you're so deeply aware of all of the ways that you're out of alignment with the cornerstone. Yeah. If you're checking boxes, like you say, with those rhythms, you become, I think, in the message on the weekend, I mentioned we're not code enforcement. Yeah. We're building materials. Yeah. And... uh, we can, we we like to address all the problems other people have when we're checking boxes. Yeah. Instead of just being in tune with our own, you know, our own self-centeredness and our own pride and having that open heart before God, you know, search me, oh God, and know my heart and mm-hmm. see if there's any, any unclean way in me. Mm-hmm. So we are not sinfully proud about following these disciplines. Yeah. We're just incredibly humbly seeking God in those things. Yeah. Uh, or else we, yeah, we, we start, you know, we start to become, I think Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes chapter seven, you can test me on that one. And I, I think it's right. It might not be, but, uh, he said, you don't want to be overly righteous. Mm. And to hear that from a guy like Solomon, I'm yeah. thinking overly righteous. I thought the goal was to be overly righteous, but what he's referring to, I think what he's referring to is that attitude uh, of just pontificating and acting like, you know, we're the spiritual one and we're going to tell everybody else, yeah. you know, what's wrong with their lives. And, you know, that's over-righteous. Yeah. Uh, over-righteousness is not righteousness. It's over-righteousness. Yeah. And, uh, and it just being in tune with who you are and who God is <laughs> and uh, keeping a, a prayer that when you understand who you are and who God is, it is simple to mm. be humble. Mm. Yeah. So you just got to have that. Well, like you say, you, you said so eloquently, just having that open heart before God. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. No, it's, I, and I think it's interesting because we don't, I, I don't know that we, like, not even from a maybe church emphasis, we don't put enough emphasis on it, but just personally for believers, I don't know that we put enough emphasis on that role of the presence of God in our lives that, man, I engage with these disciplines to get into the presence of God. Um, It's not so that I think the legalist in us, you know, Mm -hmm. the box checker wants to say, well, I do these things to make God happy with me or so I earn brownie points with him. And then that just leads us to, you know, our heads get bigger and bigger as we think, oh, I'm pretty great. The other way to engage with those practices is I'm going to have a horrible day and I'm going to be a horrible person if I don't get into the presence of God Yeah. because that's the only thing that changes me and yeah. transforms me. It's not my, it's not habit stacking my way to righteousness. It's getting into the presence of God and allowing his love and right. power to change and transform me. And it's like, man, that's a, it's so weird because they're the same practices, but it's engaging with them in very, very different ways. And, and maybe the difference, Jackson, is is that purpose piece. Yeah. Um, you know, when I am <laughs> engaging the disciplines of the faith and when I am living, you know, whatever, righteously, you know, we could define that a lot of ways. Uh, and yet I, 
I, I remind myself as to why we do that. We mm. do that to honor God, there's no doubt. And God is pleased with us when we are walking in fellowship with him. But it's that fellowship with God that keeps us on purpose, mm. on the reason that he keeps us here. You know, and you've heard me say many times, and those who are listening have probably heard me say it too over the years, but when it comes to being godly, we'll be more godly when we're not alive in this world anymore. Yeah. We'll be with him. We'll be like him. We won't have the battles with pride and the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We'll, we'll be more godly when we're not alive than when we're alive. So what is the value then of staying alive and, and pushing that flywheel of, of Christ-likeness and wanting to have that open heart before God and wanting for uh, uh, our lives to reflect his is so he can use us. Yeah to help people know who Christ is. And I do see a similar pattern around the world in different cultures, and we've been there personally, and I see this firsthand. We see it around the country. We see it in our own community. People become inwardly focused. Mm. Uh, they're, every, everything is for them, you know, and they're Christian friends. And the whole idea of church is just go listen to good sermons and then go out to lunch and just hang out with each other. And it's... It, it's a little bit sad because those people are the people that seem to struggle most with becoming the code enforcement people, they becoming the Holy Spirit for the rest of the body of Christ rather than seeing all those good things that take place on Sunday for them or whenever they gather with their church family. It's just better preparing them to reach other people for Christ yeah. and to be more, more intentional about their purpose in the world. God is still redeeming humanity from sin. That is the thing he gave us uh, as an assignment. Yeah. Is to make sure that we align our purpose with his great purpose in history. And then all of the disciplines become more natural for us, and it's easier to keep our heart open yeah. to God yeah. because we're, we're kind of sharing with him uh, his purpose for the world. Yeah. So it all kind of works together, but but I do think uh, an, um, doing the right things for the right reason is is uh, it, it has more to do with with um, with purpose and being outward focused and reaching people for Christ than yeah than not. So no, that's really good because we can totally turn ideas of spiritual formation into this kind of pursuit of becoming modern monks or gurus mm -hmm. that just kind of go off and do life by ourselves and yeah. increase our holiness and Christ-likeness and build our spiritual muscles for no purpose and no use. No eternal use. Yeah. Right. I, um, I'm, this book that I'm reading right now kind of follows this um, template for spiritual formation of being with Jesus to become like him but so that you can do the stuff that he did. Yeah. That's the, that's the goal is if, if Jesus is this rabbi, the goal was never just to always have students that just stuck with him. It was to send them out to become rabbis and call other people to do the exact same stuff that he was doing. And so in the same way, as we follow him, the following is always with ascending, you know, yeah. to, you got to go do the stuff that I've been doing. Yeah. If you want to, you know, what do we say? You want to follow Jesus, you'll end up with lost people because yeah. that's where Jesus always seemed to find himself. Yeah. You know, calling people to repentance, calling people to faith in such a, a cool way, such a great Jesus kind of way. And as we become more like him, people are going to, when I say impressed, we're not doing it for that reason, but they really are impressed with the authority with which we carry our lives and speak, not in a judgy way, yeah, but just a confident way. You yeah. know, I think that passage in First um, Peter 2 that we talked about on the weekend, uh, you know, when you realize you're a chosen people, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation. Yeah. I mean, man, I yeah. mean, that's, that gives us confidence that we, uh, and we've been chosen, we've been chosen for this. And all of those, th those three, you know, I said on the weekend, Christianity is all about the collective. And so we've got those three plurals. You got the nation, the one nation, you got the, the, the people, you got the priesthood, and you got the nation, it was the third one, the holy nation. And we are um, that 
for a reason. Yeah. To declare, you know, the praise, uh, the praises that that uh, we can't contain any longer. That people would know Christ. That people would know God. And, um, Which literally bleeds into the next passage that we're looking at this weekend. I want you to live such good lives among yeah. the pagans. Like what a what a good like such an oikos statement, right? I want you to live such good lives among people who don't know Jesus so that they would be like, what is this? You yeah. know, what do you guys have that we don't have? Right. Which is the whole oikos idea that yeah. your life becomes really beautiful and compelling to people, which is we, why the way that we live is so important. I keep beating the same drums all the time, but it's that idea of discipleship versus evangelism and sharing Christ and growing in Christ and the balance we need to find in our lives between our personal mission and our personal growth. But as we grow personally, we live better lives. Yeah. And when we live better lives, people are drawn to us. It makes the mission more natural because the yes. conversations are going to be well, there. Well, it makes the mission possible. Yeah. It's so true. Nobody wants to. <laughs> nobody wants what you're selling if your life is a disaster. And it's like, well, I have no interest in looking like you, being like you, having anything to do with the way your life is. We we just dropped a new blog post. Can I give a commercial yeah, for yeah, the Oikos Movement? Oikosmovement.com. But it's on cold evangelism, mm. and I call it chilly evangelism. And um, but the whole idea about cold evangelism is sharing Christ with people you've never met before versus living such good lives that mm. people are drawn into your web mm. of, of Christ like love. And, you know, back to the specificity of Jesus living a life that honors God by making the right choices, yeah. having the right opinions, making the right decisions, living with the right purpose. So. All of that, and to your point, the next section of, of the book, of the letter, talks about, uh, okay, now that we know who we are, yeah, let's, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's live the kind of lives that people are drawn to so that when they, you know, I, I envision people uh, hearing the gospel and responding well and standing before before. God someday, standing before Christ at the Bema judgment, the reward judgment, but glorifying God on that day mm. when they were so far away from him. Yeah. And what's the difference? They met somebody, they were on their front row, and they just watched this incredible life of confidence, knowing who we are, and living our life with, without the culture dictating to us what's appropriate or not. Mm. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, you know, here's this guy named, you know, what, what's his name? Bob, Joe, whatever it is, probably Jackson. Okay. Yeah. So we got Jackson and he's on, he's on a believer's front row. And he, there's so many voices out there in the culture talking to this guy. Yeah. But they're all basically saying the same thing, except the guy that knows Jesus. Mm. Man, that's powerful. Yeah. And if that guy that knows Jesus starts to parrot everything he hears in the culture, it just fades in insignificance. Yeah. It's just another voice among it, many. And, that it, and there's nothing new. Yeah. There's nothing worth taking notice of. And that's like living such good lives. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, steal your pop's thunder. next week. <laughs> living such good lives. All these people are living the same kind of life. Yeah. And then they meet you who's living such such a good life yeah and it's so different yeah and the impact that we can have in people is is so true i mean we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the impact we can have in the lives of the people around us until we with intentionality um start living our life the way that we're we're called to live it it's like verse nine in chapter two but you yeah the world stumbles yeah and we could stumble over the fact that they stumble. Yeah. But you don't do that. Yeah. You know, you have been called to live a certain type of life as a certain type of person, as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yeah. Get, get, get really well established in who we are. We are in Christ. That is our identity now. Yeah. And, uh, and now we can live a kind of, the kind of life that people be drawn to. Yeah. And I think that idea of 
the mission that's set before us leads us to become people who are so ruthless with hypocrisy in our lives, not saying, well, you know, we're all a little broken or it's like, no, man, I, I want to follow Jesus as closely as possible in this life, yeah. not just so that I can become a monk, but so that I can live such good lives among the people that God's placed in my life so that they could be drawn and we could have real conversations about the things that matter so that I'm, I might win them for Christ. Like what a, what a cool thing that God has set before us. Like probably many do struggle with the, why am I still here idea, you know, mm -hmm. but man, to think, man, I'm here so that I can live a good life. I can live a good life in front of people so that I can be part of what God's up to in their life. Like that's just, it's such beautiful grace um, that we get to partner with God in that. And our whole life. And yet so many of us, miss out on it and just kind of sit and twiddle our thumbs till heaven, you yeah. know? Yeah. Never, what I say, never die till you're dead. Uh, there's always purpose. There's always a reason to wake up until you don't wake up. Yeah. And then, then you'll, you know, we'll, we'll take, we'll take it to the next level yeah. <laughs> of our existence yeah. eternally. But until that day, there's a reason for us to be here. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, just looking to um, rediscover every day how God's redemptive plan affects our life and our relationships today. Yeah, yeah, and I and I loved your um, quote. You know, you kind of alluded to it here to not stumble over the way that the world stumbles over yeah. Jesus. And I think, man, in in an election year, that's a good that's a good quote for any of us to hold on to, where yeah. we. Can, and we've just seen this, right? Like for the past eight years, it seems like been really clear in churches, especially around the election year, there's just this kind of like boiling underbelly of anger that starts to grow of like, mm -hmm. man, the, our country's so weird and broken and messed up and there's just this frustration. And it's like, man, that's, everything's kind of running as it should be actually, you know, yeah. like, and, you know, later in the letter of first Peter's like, don't, don't be surprised, you know, like this is, this kind of comes with the territory. Right. And so uh, I love that. Where are some of the areas where you feel like you kind of see us stumble over the fact that the world stumbles over Jesus? Well, yeah, we, we get sucked into this uh, lack of specifics. Mm. That they want to, you talk about the specialness of Jesus and the specificity of Jesus or the specifics about his call. Um, you know, and it was that one of the things, getting back to the Super Bowl, one of the things in, um, in, in the conversation, both before and after the Super Bowl, is, is always uh, the commercials yeah. for the Super Bowl, yeah. which a lot of people watch the game just to get to the next commercial uh, because they're supposed to be, you know, that's a Super Bowl of advertising too. Um, but that whole Jesus campaign, yeah. Jesus gets us. Yeah. And I, I have no problem with that or with the people who produce those. And it's interesting how they want to um, bring Jesus into the conversation. And hopefully yeah. people are sitting at home and it's starting conversations. But it is it is not for not it does relate to the specifics, uh, excuse me, to how special Jesus is without bringing up a lot of specifics. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm not being critical. I don't want to be guilty of, of that. Uh, and props to them. Those ads are much better than watching a lot of other guys' <laughs> ads. But I, I got to say that the world loves Jesus, and so we have no problem. We can join them with on that course. Yeah. But then the world doesn't want to believe certain things, even though Jesus may have said them. So they block that out, and then we think... Well, we want to be popular. We want likes. Mm. We want to keep our jobs. Mm. Uh, so we better get on board with the culture. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, we talk about specific issues or areas where that seems to be prevalent today. But uh, we just can't let it happen. You just can't let it happen. Uh, or you lose how special it it is to be part of this this you know chosen people to be part of the priesthood to be part of this holy nation um if we're not acting like we've been chosen and we're royal and we're holy then 
it you know we lose we lose that opportunity mm. to actually be a part of what God's doing in the world today. So we have to be careful. But you, in terms of specifics, you alluded to it uh, even by asking the question. This is the year of politics again. Every four years, it or every two, but primarily presidential elections tend to bring the worst out in us. Yeah, I don't care who you are. Yeah, we become judgmental. We become finger pointers. We become bitter. We, we become make caricatures hateful. of people. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And then we tend to elevate people because we are so against the other guys. Yeah, we elevate the yeah, wrong we blindly, guys. Yeah, yeah, like oh, yeah. this is like the second coming of Jesus. And uh, we just have to remember who do we represent? Not Joe Biden. Not Donald Trump. We don't represent those guys. Mm -mm. They, they, no, we represent Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, otherwise we'll, we'll just be sucked into the debates. Yeah. You know, and you can argue your point and it might be a valid point, a political point. It might be a valid point, but it will come across to others differently. Hmm then maybe you even intend it to. Mm. So just tread carefully yeah. those political conversations um, because if we, if we aren't careful, then we'll start championing candidates and people that aren't even godly. Yeah. yeah. And then the world is saying, okay, wait a minute, you're a Christian. You say you stand for Christian values, but the candidate that you're promoting doesn't seem to be that. Yeah. So we just have to be careful. This is a, there are so many landmines in the next nine months. Yeah. Nine or 10 months for Christians. Um, uh, we are partners in the gospel. We're not partners in politics. Mm. Yeah. And whether you like to admit it or not, whatever your political party is, there are uh, people who don't agree with you that either are believers or they need to become believers. Yeah. So we can't alienate them. Yeah. And we can't make them the enemy. Once no. again, our battle isn't with flesh and blood. Every candidate running for office this year is flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Our battle is not against them. Yeah. Our battle is against our common enemy. And uh, boy, we got to gear up every day to go to battle against that guy. And if we're not careful, you know, once again, we'll become code enforcers. Yeah. Rather than just recognize we're building materials. We have to align with the cornerstone. That's our job. Yeah. And vote. I mean, I'm registered to vote. Yeah. I'm going to mail in my ballot soon <laughs> uh, because we, we we vote that way. But, yeah, we're, we're Jesus followers. Yeah. It is interesting watching the way that we react to people stumbling over the cornerstone with Jesus. You got, you know, like that. You, you see this group that is, it's going to be, you know, really interesting over the next five to ten years to watch this where you've got groups of churches that are changing the message for the sake of the mission you know that's kind of their yes. their guys right? right we want to win more people so we're changing the message and it's like man the message is so good that you actually don't have to change it at all for the sake of the mission it's way more compelling than the edits that we're trying to add to the message and so you've got this group that really looks a lot like us, acts a lot like us. The churches seem very similar, but there's going to be this growing deep divide between yeah. us over the coming years. It seems like it's just going to keep growing. And then you've got this other kind of change to the message where uh, the message almost becomes, it becomes political in using politics almost as a way, a means of control almost to force people not to stumble over the cornerstone. And it's like, man, I, I don't see where that goal is in scripture to force the world not to stumble over the cornerstone. Yeah. That's the whole point is that the world will continue to stumble over the cornerstone. It's foolishness to them. And so it's kind of this interesting, both are trying to alleviate the stumbling problem. And it's like the stumbling is there for a reason. One is let's change the message to just be more accommodating. The other is almost, I wonder if we could control the message, use, change the message to a political one and almost gain more control. It's yeah two kind of routes that you can go. Yeah, you, get, you just got to be careful. I mean, I look at a different topic, but we'll see some, maybe in a minute, we'll see some uh, common commonality between the two worlds. But you look at church leadership. 
And that's different than political leadership, I realize. <laughs> um, when you see the, the requirements for leading a church, I mean, you can read about it. And Paul yeah. writes Timothy and Titus both, gives the list. So you got this list, and it's not exhaustive, but it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty good list. Yeah. Virtually all of it has to do with temperament. Mm. There's very little about theology. Now, there's an assumption that theology will be right, so yeah. I, I'm not saying theology is not important. Anybody who knows me would never believe that I would think that anyway. It's very important what we believe. It's very important what people believe and who we support, rally around. But, man, when Paul said, when you pick a leader, look at their temperament. Mm. And I'm just thinking we, we forget that. Mm. Uh, and we forget it in church. And, and we forget it outside of church. Yeah. Who do you want to pattern your life after? Who do you want to follow? Who do you want to include your name in the list with their names? You know, you got to look at their character and their temperament mm. because those are the leaders we follow. Mm. Now, you ask me who in the political spectrum would be that kind of an individual. Well, I'd have to think about that. Yeah. But that's it's harder to do yeah. out there. Yeah. Uh, but even in in church world, you and I both know this. We both grew up in pastors' families. Yeah. We're both pastors now. Yeah. Same thing. You know, there are a lot of gifted people out there, a lot of charismatic leaders out there. And uh, they say the right things. Yeah. But eventually their life crashes and burns because there's no integrity, there's no character, there's no temperament there that is godly, that is Christ-like. Mm. I don't know how this digressed into a political conversation, <laughs> but uh, no, you asked, where are we gonna stumble? Yeah. Oh, baby, yep. that's where we're gonna stumble this year. Yeah. Big time, maybe not the only place, yeah. but a place. And I sure. think that leads us to a good spot of like, man, it's it's okay to have, to have hopes in some of those areas, but not capital H, hope. And my, exactly. I'm going to keep reminding myself that when I do see the world, our country, stumble over Jesus, we're right where we should be. Yes. That's not, I, I think some might be under the impression that it is our job to turn our nation into something that doesn't stumble over the cornerstone. And it's like, I, I don't see that in scripture where that's even a possibility. It is just going to, I mean, now we're getting into the Crusades, right? Like, how effective was that? It <laughs> wasn't, wasn't super effective. That was a bad time to be alive, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. And uh, the Chiefs didn't win the Super Bowl, or they did win the Super Bowl. Jesus did not come back, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, Jesus didn't return, but he's going to. Yep. Jesus is coming back. I can, let me make that prediction. Yeah. That's my stone-cold prediction for I'm the with, future. I'm with you on that. Jesus is coming Put all my back. money on that. And until he does, I'm still pushing the flywheel for his, yeah, for his kingdom, yeah, and for his program, and um, that, and yeah. don't become ineffective, getting frustrated that the world is stumbling, while there's people all around us that we have the opportunity to influence and live missionally with. And what? Yeah, it, they're going to stumble till he comes back. Yeah, they they're just going to. Yeah, but we can't. It's again, but you. <laughs> This is the way they are. They stumble over the cornerstone, but not you. Not us. So. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Pastor Tom. I appreciate oh, the it's time. it's my pleasure, Yeah, honestly. Anytime you can come by, we appreciate it. Thank you, Yeah, Jackson. Good job. Well, I uh, hope that it's been an encouraging conversation for you, and if you've got uh, some tangible takeaways uh, from Pastor Tom's message this weekend, we'd love to see them there in the comments. As always, don't forget to like the video, maybe share it with a friend uh, who would be encouraging to, and subscribe so that you get future videos as well. That's all we have for this week on Tangible Takeaways. We'll catch you guys next yeah, week. Thank you.